Hello and welcome to week one, part four of EGM 703, Converting Radiance to Temperature. In this lesson, we'll cover how to convert what the sensor actually measures, radiance, into what we want to measure or observe, which is temperature. We'll also talk about a few common satellite missions that we can use for our own thermal remote sensing applications. In this lesson, we're going to cover how we go from radiance to temperature. But first, we need to be sure we're clear about what we mean by temperature. From previous lessons, remember that all substances are made up of atoms or molecules. When we're above absolute zero, or zero Kelvin, these atoms or molecules have some kind of vibrational motion. And as a result of that motion, they also emit or radiate energy. So temperature then, is a measure of the average energy contained in those atoms or molecules. If an object has a high temperature, it contains more energy, usually in the form of heat. This isn't the end of the story, though. We can think of an object's kinetic temperature as its true temperature. True in very heavy quotation marks here. This is the temperature that you measure if your thermometer is in contact with the substance. For example, if you stick a thermometer under your tongue. The radiant temperature, on the other hand, is what we actually measure with remote sensing. And as you might have guessed by the fact that we're making this distinction, there is a difference which we will see as we continue through this lesson. So in order to estimate temperature from a satellite image, the image values need to be converted from digital numbers, or DN, values to radiance. To do this, the sensor and the images have to be calibrated. This is normally done in one of two ways, either internally to the sensor, normally using an onboard black body with a known radiance and temperature, or externally, using objects with known radiances that are visible in the image itself. For Landsat images, like we'll be using in this week's practical, the calibration is performed by the United States Geological Survey. All we have to do is take the rescaling values provided in the metadata and plug them into the equation shown here. In general, the calibration routine for most satellite images takes the form of a linear rescaling based on the minimum and maximum radiance recorded by the sensor, similar to the one shown here. Most sensors will have information available about the calibration procedure, and most modern sensors now provide the calibration, material, calibration values for you so that you can rescale the values yourself. Once we have radiance, we can use Planck's law of black body radiation to estimate the radiant temperature. We've seen this equation before, but this form of the equation gives us the spectral radiance as a function of wavelength and temperature. The constants here are H, which is Planck's constant, K, which is the Boltzmann constant, and C, which is the speed of light in a vacuum. The units for each of the variables are shown here in the table on the side, and note that because this is the spectral radiance, denoted L with a lambda subscript, the units are watts per steradian per cubic meter. Since we're dividing the radiance, which is watts per steradian per square meter, by the wavelength, which has units of meters. What this also tells us is that if we can measure radiance, we can calculate the radiant temperature by inverting this equation for the temperature. And we'll see what this looks like on the next slide. Remember again that most objects or materials are not perfect black bodies, which means that they have an emissivity less than one, and we need to take this into account when we're trying to calculate the surface temperature. When we invert Planck's law, we end up with an expression to calculate brightness temperature. This is the temperature that we would measure if all of the objects in our image were ideal black bodies. Remember from the previous slide that H, C, and K are all constants, and for a given sensor, so is the wavelength. This means that we can simplify this equation slightly to the following form, where K2 is equal to H times C divided by K times lambda, and K1 is equal to 2 times H times C squared 
divided by lambda to the fifth power. For Landsat images, which we will be using again in this week's practical, the USGS gives the sensor-specific values of K2 and K1, which again you will see when we work with this week's practical. Remember now, this is all assuming that we're observing black bodies. Unfortunately, the world is not so simple as that, and we have to somehow correct the brightness temperature to account for this fact in order to estimate the surface temperature. In this equation, we see that we calculate the surface temperature as a function of the brightness temperature, T sub b, and the emissivity of the surface. Of course, this approach also neglects the atmospheric component of the spectral radiance or assumes that it's already been corrected. In the next, le in the next lesson, we'll look at some ways that we can actually do this. We'll shift focus slightly to look at a few of the satellite sensors that we might use to estimate surface temperature. The first of these is the Advanced Very High Resolution Radiometer, or ABHRR. It was first launched in 1978 aboard the TIROS-N satellite. It operates in two different modes. The first is Local Area Coverage, or LAC, and this is approximately 1.1 times 1.1 kilometers resolution. The second is Global Area Coverage, or GAC, which gives approximately 1.1 times 4 kilometers resolution. AVHRR comes in two different versions that have either four or five bands. The first version acquires in thermal infrared wavelengths between 10.5 and 11.5 micrometers, while the second version has two thermal infrared bands, band 4 acquiring at wavelengths between 10.3 and 11.3 micrometers, and band 5 between 11.5 and 12.5 micrometers. AVHRR is still in operation on a few different satellites, though the sensor design has since been succeeded by the Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer Suite, or VIIRS. To download AVHRR data, head on over to earthdata.nasa.gov. You'll need to open a free account to access the data if you don't already have one. We've worked with Landsat data before, but I thought it might be worth it to revisit the thermal infrared band specifically. The first Landsat sensor to feature a thermal band was the thematic mapper carried on both Landsat 4 and 5. The temporal coverage for these images ranges from 1982 to 2011, though the temporal, re the temporal resolution is often extremely variable. Band 6 of the thematic mapper acquired in the thermal infrared between 10.4 and 12.5 micrometers at 120 meters spatial resolution. And at this point, I would like to once again remind you that spatial resolution and pixel size are not the same thing. When you download Landsat data, the thermal bands have been resampled to 30 meters to match the other bands. The next Landsat sensor to carry a thermal sensor was the Enhanced Thematic Mapper Plus carried on the Landsat 7 satellite. The temporal coverage for these images starts in 1999 and is still ongoing, though Landsat 7 is rapidly approaching the end of its mission. Like Thematic Mapper Band 6, ETM Plus Band 6 covers wavelengths from 10.4 to 12.5 micrometers, though with a spatial resolution of 60 meters, which again has been resampled to 30 meters. After that, we have the Thermal Infrared Sensor, or TIRS, carried aboard the Landsat 8 satellite. These images cover 2013 and are still ongoing with two thermal infrared bands. Uh, band 10 from 10.6 to 11.19 micrometers and band 11 from 11.5 to 12.51 micrometers. Each of these bands have a spatial resolution of 100 meters, again resampled to 30 meters pixel size. And coming very soon, will hopefully have a Landsat 9, which has a launch plan for no later than 23rd September 2021. This satellite will carry an upgraded version of the Landsat 8 sensors, with data hopefully starting to be acquired before the end of 2021. You can get Landsat data by heading to earthexplorer.usgs.gov, and as with earthdata.nasa.gov, you'll need to sign up for a free account. The last sensor we'll look at today is ASTER, the Advanced Spaceborne Thermal Emission and Reflection Radiometer, which was carried aboard NASA's Terra satellite. 
Aster started acquiring data since 2000, and as of 2021, it is still acquiring with the end of the mission currently planned for September 2023. Aster has five bands in the thermal infrared, which makes it especially useful for studying surface temperature and emissivity. Aster thermal infrared bands have a 90 meter spatial resolution, so comparable to the Landsat A TIRS scenes. NASA also provide level two data sets, including both atmospherically and emissivity <coughs> including both atmospherically and emissivity corrected surface temperature, as well as the emissivity products. And again, all of these data are available at earthdata.nasa.gov, free of charge. As we've seen in the thermal infrared, satellites measure the radiance emitted by the Earth's surface. Once we have calibrated these measurements, we can calculate the brightness temperature of the Earth's surface using the measured radiance and by inverting Planck's law for black body radiation. In order to calculate the land surface temperature, though, we need to know the emissivity of the surface. We should also correct for atmospheric effects, which we'll discuss more in the next lesson. We also looked at a few different sensors that provide thermal infrared data. These are, of course, not the only options, and we'll see a few other examples over the next couple of lessons. Once again, you can read further about most of the concepts we've covered in this lesson in the textbooks, Chapter 4.11 of Lewis and Kiefer and Chipman. I've provided links to some more information about AVHRR and the Landsat calibration validation procedure here, as well as links to a couple of papers that cover estimating surface temperature from thermal infrared images. For even more examples, please see the Zotero group library for this module. That's all for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me or post in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Bye!